Hello, this is Duncan Stewart from Dublin. Uh, I'm an environmentalist and I am very interested in being involved in this India Day. It's really important. And greetings to all of you in India, right across India. And uh, I'm looking forward to your views on my aspect of the important kind of interaction between India and, and Ireland. From my perspective, you know, we look at sustainability with economic and social and environmental issues all being critically important to, to discuss. And that as we move forward post COVID, that we enter a new time where we, we deal with trade and with international movement of people and, and transport of goods across the world in a more sustainable way where we are safe from viruses, but at the same time where we minimize the impacts of production and consumption and our use of fossil fuels and all of these other issues that create major pressures on the environment. So I'm very interested in Indians' views on these. I understand the pressures that you've got in India with water quality issues and you have lots of environmental issues and climate change is already impacting India quite seriously. Here in Ireland, the impacts are there also, but I think we're probably not experiencing the impacts as much as India is today. So I'm looking at the overall issues of, you know, as we move forward in society internationally and how India and Ireland can collaborate with each other on many issues that where we could benefit greatly from and where there are great opportunities for new livelihoods and for new, new trading operate op opportunities. But in doing so, we need to make sure that we do it in a safe way and, and in a way that doesn't further damage the environment. You know, I think we all understand how serious climate change is today. We also know that we're going to an incredibly unprecedented time in the destruction of nature and wildlife. And with all of this destruction, you know, as humans expand further and encroach further into natural habitats, not alone is it doing massive damage to wildlife and to nature, but it's also ex exposing us humans to greater levels of infections from COVID-19, but also from other diseases that we're, we're out there across the world. And as we know that 75%, you know, science have proven that 75% of all viruses and pathogens and, and uh, infectious diseases, microbial diseases, are caused by humans interfering with nature. You know, so we are the cause of this. You know, we can't blame uh, an individual tiny little virus called COVID-19, that, that's not the, the cause. These, these viruses are out there in nature, you know, everywhere. And they've coexisted with other species across nature in different habitats in a way that has lasted for millions of years. But it's our kind of extra encroachment and, and, and in the way we, that we are stressing nature and, and that the whole zoonotic transfer or spillover into humans can occur. Also with our animals, our farmed animals, you know, in very high concentrations of pigs and poultry and cattle, in these very high concentration numbers in indu industrial farming is also putting massive pressure for super spreaders to occur of, of viruses across the world. So we understand through COVID that this trajectory that the, the global um, trading is and movement of people across the world is no longer a way that we can go forward. So we need to reinvent how we deal with these issues. Otherwise, we're going to see more and more problems like what we're seeing today with COVID-19 and as we, we've heard in, in the previous session. So there's an awful lot to learn. But I think for me, I would start with climate change, which is the greatest existential threat and challenge 
that civilization has ever had to face. When we think of our children's future, we need to understand that the trajectory we're on at the moment globally is incredibly unsustainable and it is going to have major impacts for so many people, billions of people across the planet over the next 20, 30 years and beyond. So all those young people across the world, all those young people in India will be exposed to these issues. And it's so important that when we're trading with each other and when we're coming up with new ways of, of, of producing and, and, uh, and, and increasing productivity and all of these and, and movement of people across the world, that we, we do it in such a way that it is not going to further damage uh, climate change with greenhouse gases. If we look at today, you know, global concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere are now at an unprecedented high level of 415 parts per million. Now that, if we think over the last 800,000 years, the science has shown quite clearly that the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere varied between 180 and 280 parts per million. Now we're at 415 parts per million. Now this is an incredible change, which over the last 800,000 years, we are now nearly 50% above the figures there were in the atmosphere over that massive length of time. And we're now at the highest in greenhouse gas emissions that have occurred in over 3 million years, possibly 5 million years, and rapidly towards heading towards what was 15 million years ago in the atmosphere. So we have to understand how serious these greenhouse gas emissions are affecting our climate system in terms of global heating, in terms of sea level rise, in terms of acidification of our oceans. All these massive pressures are, are, are building up and they're going to have huge repercussions for people all across the planet and for all other species. When I look at wildlife and nature, you know, and, and look at humans, say, take for example, the fact that over the last hundred years, human population quadrupled in a hundred years. During that time, livestock numbers, cattle, sheep, pigs, poultry, all of these animals that we farm, we, we managed to increase their, their levels eightfold in that hundred years. So we have a situation where we have, in, 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 in producing so many cattle and, and, and sheep and, and pigs and poultry, we have encroached more and more into nature for feedstock for these animals. And we've seen the damage of the plundering of our rainforests and of our oceans for fish, how serious they are now today. But also when we think it's not just, you know, the damage we're doing, but the populations of wildlife species have now plummeted down to 40% of what they were 50 years ago. So in other words, we've lost 60% of all wildlife species, mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, all of these have reduced. And at the same time, insects have plummeted by 80%, down to 20%. But this is shocking. And I think we have to understand that we humans live basically in a biosphere on this earth that, that allows life to exist. And that in doing so, we share this biosphere with all of these other species. And it is the interaction between all of these species and the interdependence of these species that we have with others that we can exist on this planet. When we break those connections with nature and we we create kind of massive damage to nature, we will see huge repercussions in terms of how humans can survive because we depend on the ecosystem services from nature for our very survival, for our breathing of air, of quality of air, for quality of our water, for, for everything basically, for our greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
you know, in, in controlling that. And, and it's so important that we don't lose sight of that incredibly important connection. And COVID has been surely a great kind of wake up call for us to realize that this direction that we're going is unsustainable. So I'm, 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 I'm just looking at these two big issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. But also, if we look at plastics and the damage that plastics have done, you know, in, 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 in the last 50 years, and especially in the last 20 years, the massive damage, especially of microplastic, the way it has now kind of basically got into all of our rivers and waterways and lakes, and, and into our, all of our oceans across the world, and the damage it's doing to wildlife is massive. So we have to understand that all of this disposable waste that we're producing, we have to stop all of this. We see how India has to cope with, with these massive amounts of, of, of disposable litter that's in, in, in India's rivers and lakes and everywhere. And they're here in Ireland the same way. And I just would like to say that we in Ireland, we're not a good example for India. I mean, India has performed extremely well in the terms of greenhouse gas emissions. India's greenhouse mass emissions are what, two and a half tons per person on average in India. Our greenhouse gas emissions are 12 and a half million tons. But basically, it's so important that we learn from India of how to deal with a lot of these. We have an awful lot to learn, we have an awful lot to share, we can work a lot together. And this day to day is an important opportunity for us to engage with each other, come up with new ideas, see how we can share these ideas and work together. So thank you for listening. Well done. Mr. Jan, it was uh, Mr. Duncan is Stewart, he's a wonderful speaker and he's doing wonderful work to protect earth and uh, ecology. And uh, now our very special guest from India, Mr. Pankaj Jain. He, he served al almost 37, 39 years in Indian Administrative Service. There's no any position which Mr. Jain haven't served and looked after. And he retired from Indian civil services from the highest position that was the secretary to the government of India. He worked in various uh, regions, locations, places, particularly in Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, Mr. Jain visited Ireland three times and he's a fond of Ireland. He has some sort of love affair with Ireland and he considered Ireland as a friend. He met many dignitaries in uh, his last uh, trip uh, when he was secretary, additional secretary in the government of India. And uh, uh, the current, and currently Mr. Jain is heading to very uh, good organizations, building millions of to toilets, and doing wonderful work to clean environment and clean uh, water and provide clean water to the people. So Mr. Jain, this is your dice. You put your views across and if time allows, we will have a few minutes discussion. Thank you, Prashant, uh, for the very nice uh, introduction. I don't know whether I deserve all the things which you have said about me, but thank you very much. Uh, today, good morning from uh, India to viewers in Ireland and a very good afternoon to viewers in India. I'd like to uh, discuss environmental issues across the world with uh, special reference to India and Ireland and some of the possible interventions which uh, have been taken and what are uh, uh, possible to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at it uh, with the rising global population and a very uh, increasing economic development in the world, especially using uh, technologies which are also changing day to day and using chemicals, different type of chemicals, it is uh, obvious that uh, natural that uh, environmental challenges will arise and some kinds of you know, environmental degradation will keep on happening. And we see the increasing degradation in, uh, in terms of air, water and, and soil and noise pollution. 
depletion of oxygen levels, degradation of uh, land topsoil, degradation of rivers, lakes, and water bodies, and of forests, wildlife, and biodiversity. And you know, it threatens our own living on this earth. So we have to do something about it. And the world, of course, in addition, is seeing a huge climate uh, change, mainly due to the increase in greenhouse gases. And is also seeing an uh, increase in per capita carbon footprint. Duncan has very rightly talked about the, you know, the emission and contribution by various countries to the carbon dioxide emissions in, in the world. The average over the world is only 4.8 MT, but countries like USA, for example, contribute you know 14.95 MT per capita of uh, carbon dioxide emission contributing to the greenhouse gases. And if you look at that figure and you compare, let's say, India, India produces between 1.57, and Duncan has quoted rightly, you know, 2.5 MT, mm -hmm. much lower than the, uh, the figure of US. And China does somewhere in between 6.57 MT. Uh, this implies there is a need for, you know, having some kind of equity in the world with developed nations making every effort to reduce their contribution to greenhouse gases uh, as compared to the developing world in, in, uh, to ensure a sustainable habitat for the future generations. And one option, of course, is to move on to cleaner fuels uh, so that uh, the production of uh, greenhouse gases to that extent is reduced. Another uh, example or other uh, figure I'd like to quote, the USA consumes 16 times the per capita oil as compared to India and six times as compared to China. So you see the inequity between nations. So you, one can't fault any, I mean, you know, one nation or the other. We have to work together on this issue of controlling greenhouse gases. Now, but if you look at another figure, overall China, because of its large population and because of their higher economic or productive activity, it contributes much more greenhouse, uh, I mean, much more uh, carbon uh, dioxide emission as compared to USA and Europe combined. So this uh, is also a point to, uh, to be noted. So very recently, you know, in the Indian Prime Minister only yesterday announced that he would like to see and he would like to work towards Ladakh territory, the civilian territory in India, to be made carbon neutral. That means to counter the carbon dioxide emissions, we would like to see that there is a reabsorption back into the earth uh, into the, by way of carbon sinks. And one, of course, option is, you know, forestation. If you have large tracts of land available, and if you develop forests over it, and there is a scheme, I will talk about it a little later, then you can, uh, through these carbon sinks, you know, make the carbon, uh, this thing, uh, carbon neutral, the territory. The area of Ladakh, you know, abounds in sunshine also. And uh, this is a huge opportunity to have solar power, which will uh, not be a polluting source of uh, power. And uh, thereby, you know, learn, uh, earn, thereby Ladakh can earn a large number of carbon credits. You know, another issue which had been earlier causing concern was the depletion of ozone layer by a way of, you know, production of chemicals which are called, you know, ozone depleting chemicals. Now, uh, you know, this was followed by um, a Montreal uh, protocol in, I believe in 1987, which uh, uh, most uh, all, all nations signed and banning the use of uh, CFCs, halons and other ozone depleting chemicals. And this is a very good example of international collaboration uh, in uh, stopping further uh, uh, what we call degradation of the environment. And uh, this, uh, uh, we would be very happy as uh, part of the I mean, nations that uh, this kind of you know example uh, can be duplicated elsewhere also. Now in India, you know, as you probably aware that uh, uh, the environment is regulated by the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change, and a number of policies uh, are there to uh, with the ministry which mitigate, uh, which are meant to mitigate uh, environmental damage. 
and further to uh, you know prevent further degradation a notable policy in this is the compensatory afforestation and there is a fund set up it's called campa compensatory afforestation uh, what you call there is a fund for it because its name is campa the idea is that any project uh, new project which is going to you know above a certain level and which requires the clearance or destruction of any part of a forest then that requires to go through a forest committee and uh, there is a committee at the state level then there is a committee at the central level and to compensate for the damage to the forest the uh, project authorities have to uh, pay a sum which goes into the uh, fund called campa and the idea is that you know present india has a forest cover about 25% our intention is to increase it to 33% you will be happy to know that uh, as per the report of 2019 we have added 5188 square kilometers of forest in two years this is a good record for the country and uh, you know this uh, compensatory uh, forestation is supposed to be done on wetlands uh, sorry it's wastelands and degraded forests or degraded uh, soil uh, Basically, in So this is uh, uh, continuing, and uh, there is a, 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 a ministry called Jal Shakti in India. Now this has a directorate called the National River Conservation Directorate, and the idea is to uh, you know clean out rivers. And what we have started is with the Ganga Action Plan. If you look at it, Ganga the basin is the largest basin in the world. river basin in the world and uh, 400 million people live in that in this basin which is one third of india and this basin is huge the population which stays in this is 400 million we look at the in large figure so the government of india has started with the pollution abatement measures in the ganga river basin and we set up this directorate and is responsible for collection transportation and treatment of municipal sewage riverfront development and construction of low cost toilets for people who is to defecate you know near the uh, river that has been banned nobody can construct and i believe uh, 500 or 1 km from the river and nobody can be found doing any nuisance next to the river so as you know probably that uh, there used to be dolphins in the ganga now they are not there now we the prime minister has announced yesterday to have a dolphin mission he wants to reintroduce dolphins in in the ganga it can be done only when you reduce the bod and the cod in the ganges and that's the one of the objectives of the national river conservation directorate and if you look at it you know the rivers all over the world are the major sources of uh, drinking water and water for household use but if you have these so polluted then uh, you know we have to do something about it very quickly you know uh, talking about rivers you know the surface water is the desired uh, source for drinking you know in india we also have the underground water i'm sure ireland also has that the ground uh, water is receding year to year and uh, you know this uh, also is causing a lot of concern government has made many four states have made rain water harvesting compulsory which means if you want to erect a building in an urban area you have to have river of the rain water harvesting in place so as to regenerate the ground water another thing i wanted to say you know in this uh, the rivers in india they you know, they have to be they are just running the water into the sea now what are the options the option is to dredge the middle of the river and contain the flood plain plain zone and still maintain the e flow that you would have achieved you can slow the river and use that water and this is this should be done in the future it costs a lot of money and incidentally if you do this you will be able to regenerate the ground water through natural seepage this uh, people are aware of this but uh, it costs a lot of money 
Now, we have a national green tribunal, probably you've heard of this. Uh, it's, uh, it handles all the court cases which uh, impinge on environmental degradation or environmental pollution concerning, you know, and also conservation of us. And people can go to this with a PIL, public interest litigation. But, you know, people who are actually affected by that, let's say the tribal populations, who had forest rights, they can go to this also. But uh, PILs and sewer motor actions by NGT are a little gray area because they have been happening, but uh, there have been a lot of noises that uh, it's not covered under the NGT Act. So this is something which, of course, being worked on. Now, one another pollution in uh, India is the air pollution. If you look at the figures, uh, the safe figure for pm 2.5 is just 60 and most countries uh, in europe i know ireland is very clean you have hardly any population you have a population of uh, 5 million people only i mean delhi has a population of 20 million so and delhi is uh, you know ireland is 57 times the land size of delhi so look at the thing you will uh, automatically india will uh, delhi will have 200 times population by this ratio so uh, delhi you know in the summers it has a pm 2.5 roughly between 100 to 200 and in the winters it climbs up to 300 to 500 which is huge and that's what's causing a lot of lung problems in people even children have lung problems we are very careful about it we have air purifiers in every room and uh, generally we shut our uh, this thing out you know you see the you can see the back you know it's all shut by glass and air conditioners are on so we don't see any dust but we are the higher people you know in the country the higher earning people what do you think of the common people they are suffering when you go out on the road you breathe in that dirty air and the smog in the winters it's just horrible now, some, some things have been done in India on this issue. I mean, the causes are so many. It's old vehicles. So India has banned vehicles, more than 15 years old petrol. And in case of diesel, more than 10 years old. And, uh, you know, construction activity causes a lot of dust. So there are measures uh, which are enforced. But there's a lot of, uh, you know, leakage in that enforcement, I would say. And there are industry emissions. Uh, you know, Delhi is, has banned new industry to be set up inside the inside Delhi, but the existing ones, you know, is very difficult to really push them out. And some are non-polluting, so they are continuing. But basically, you know, there is a ban on fresh industry within Delhi area. And there is another issue, you know, the agricultural stubble burning. This is a problem uh, which was all over the world, all over the world. I have examples from. Other countries, people have control in different measures. There are uh, countries which regulate it, give a license for the burning and all that. But in India, the problem is so huge that all these measures won't work. Uh, you know, India, uh, the government has come out with a scheme of subsidizing two type of technologies. One is called the happy cedar, which you might have heard of it. You know, there is a small gap, only 15 days between uh, the rice harvesting in uh, March, April, and then sowing of the wheat crop. And in that 15 days, it's not uh, possible to take out uh, mechanically all the stubble and then uh, replant the, I mean, plant the seed of uh, wheat. So this uh, happy cedar machine, which costs uh, a lot of money in terms of, I mean, Indian, this thing, the one and a half, 150,000 rupees, which uh, would be how much? Uh, 200 euros, I think, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. Uh, 2,000 euros, sorry. 2,000 euros. Hmm. So uh, for the farmers in India, it was a little expensive. Uh, they live, many of them, on the borderlines. And therefore, the government of India decided to give a subsidy on it. And similar subsidies also available on another machine, which is called the Super Straw Management System. The harvester so by the time of harvesting the rice it uh, at the same time cuts the stubble and distributes it all over the field first cuts it and then distributes it so that uh, stubble burning is not necessary 
Otherwise, if you look at it, you know, you burn the stubble, it contains potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, which are so valuable to the crop, next crop. And if you save it, you can increase the crop yield by 10 to 15 percent. This is the, and this was, uh, stubble burning was banned by Supreme Court of India, but the question is, banning is easy, but if you don't have an alternative to uh, this thing, then it was not workable. Another thing I would like to say to control noise and uh, pollution as well as to control the PM 2.5 and PM 10. Last year, the government of India uh, limited the number of hours in which crackers could be lit during Diwali festival. Now, this is a very kind of religious issue because as you are aware that Diwali is uh, when Ram, the uh, God, which is, uh, you know, the all Hindus pray to. Uh, when he returned from his forest life after 15 years, then to welcome him, lamps were lit by his uh, brother and by all the residents of uh, the, um, uh, his kingdom. And therefore, it was a very touchy matter, but uh, they limited with limited uh, type of crackers and uh, lighting. It has been allowed. But the ones which cause a lot of pollution have been banned. And the uh, time has been limited. So that your number of crackers become less. Now, I, coming to Ireland, you know, Ireland is very fortunate, as I was mentioning, that it has a population of only 4.9 million, uh, which is, as I mentioned, uh, you know, only 25% of Delhi's population. And Delhi is only a city. So, if you look at the whole country, it is, it is huge. So, the area of Ireland is 57 times. And this uh, 100 times less uh, population density in Ireland you know, reduces the chance of uh, environmental degradation to a large extent. And therefore, you have a good life expectancy in, in Ireland. Environmental factors are good. But there are issues like, uh, when two, three issues I'll mention, I mean, you know it better, just uh, touching them or flagging them. Uh, the use of chemicals is all over in the developed world. And of course, climate change is universal. Can't stop it. Right from South North Pole to South Pole, climate change. Every country is responsible for it. As I mentioned, the uh, contribution by USA is the highest per capita, at least. And overall, China is the highest. Now, um, due to the use of chemicals, there is a chance of, uh, or there are diseases like cancer, or stroke, or heart diseases in Ireland. And then studies have shown. That 13 out of 100 deaths in in, uh, in Ireland are premature because of the uh, effect of chemicals, cancers, uh, which they cause. So this is some area which uh, Ireland needs to look into. Uh, and people in lower economic strata, as anywhere else, they are most vulnerable. In uh, that's true of India also, and in any way, uh, and that's true of Ireland also. Climate change, you know, still remains the biggest challenge for the whole of Europe, the whole of the world. So this touches uh, Ireland also. Uh, and there I will uh, touch a little bit. You know, if we move to, towards like Montreal-like declarations, and if we uh, are able to create a sustainable population uh, and a sustainable habitat, it's very difficult. You know, you have the SDGs, but uh, all of them are not being achieved by everybody. In you know, countries like Africa are behind. I mean, continents are uh, behind. India has made a lot of progress, and uh, we at least have all the issues on mat. We understand them. We are implementing them. Maybe a little slowly at times because of lack of uh, resources or the huge populations. But India is on board, basically. That's what I wanted to say. And actually, if we create a sustainable habitat, then over time, then we will be able to control the problems of all these pollutions, which I mentioned, especially the chemical and the climate change, which will uh, you know keep on happening. We need to have safe disposal for chemicals as well as for uh, medical waste. So this, uh, uh, well, even when you control the other uh, pollutions, the chemical and uh, medical and uh, climate change are still going to remain in uh, Europe and, uh, and all the developed world. What to say of India? They will remain for a long time unless uh, until we have all sustainable 
practices in place, which means safe disposals basically and least use or three hours, reduce, recycle. Uh, the, there is a third, I mean, three hours. You know. Now, in coming to some other issues, um, some key challenges I believe in Ireland are you, you have, you know, population of, of heifers and cows around uh, 7 million, which is more than the human population. And these are spread over, I believe, on uh, one, uh, one, uh, one, one, one uh, thousand farms, one, 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 zero, zero, zero farms, 0.1 million farms, a huge number of farms. And every farm on average has 62 heifers and cows. So there is a need to, uh, what I was told that, uh, and humans, of course, live in the, those farms. There is a need for us to have uh, on-site waste water disposal. So what we are using all over the world, and uh, wherever you have isolated pockets, we are using septic tanks all over the world. So the technology. But you know, I would like to touch on this uh, as part of Sulab. I am uh, chairman of uh, CSR and projects in Sulab. Sulab International Social Service Organization is a 50-year-old uh, social NGO in India. And it has done a yeoman's job, a huge job they've done. Uh, we built, you know, 1.5 uh, million toilets and uh, some 9,000 uh, uh, community toilets on pay and use basis in the towns. And uh, we have invented the twin pit. Uh, Sulab International has invented the uh, Dr. Patrick is the founder. You invented the twin pit on site waste water disposal system of toilets. Now, the plus point are two, three in this. One is it uses very little water. Second is very cheap. And third is that uh, you don't need a septic tank because we combine the in septic tank, you have anaerobic. Uh, what you call uh, conversion. Now here we have, um, and then you have a soap pit after that. In this twin pit system, there are two pits, left and right, and we use only one at one time. So when that that fills up, we can uh, we uh, block that and start filling the other one. And in one month or so, or two months, we find that the uh, pit we had used earlier totally dries and converts to manure. Now that is usable as manure in the farms, and it doesn't uh, pollute the uh, groundwater. That is also being tested. Using this technology, Government of India has built 110 million toilets in five years. 110 million, which is you know 50 times of the toilets which Ireland has in the houses. 50 times. So every year, India has built 10 times the toilets, individual home toilets, as uh, Ireland has in, in the, all the houses combined. It's a huge figure. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's one of the biggest missions which uh, uh, the Prime Minister implemented. And I'm glad to say that uh, when I was Secretary, I had initiated this mission, uh, Swachh Bharat. I had given the uh, idea to the Honorable Prime Minister that let us have a Clean India, clean India, and one of the points is uh, starting with the toilet. Because there are so many other issues of uh, you know solid waste disposal, and but if you start with one issue, you can always tackle the next one, and the next, and then next, and a country is going to the next. I mean now uh, water into every house, uh, and electricity. Of course, every house, including every village, every village house has been connected by electricity. And water, every village is going to be connected very shortly. And for the floating populations in the village or landless laborers, they're going to build more community toilets. Government of India is mentioned. So, what I was, why I mentioned all this is, you know, uh, where you have large number of cows and uh, heifers, you have a lot of uh, dung, you know, uh, output. So, this waste can be converted through biogas. Uh, uh, plants into biogas, and India, of course, you know, Sulab has a lot of experience in this. We have constructed five or six in Afghanistan and a number of bio toilet, uh, biogas toilets in 
in India itself. Uh, we are willing to share our expertise, and if you want, you can build it in uh, Ireland on a turnkey basis. So Prashant will be in touch with me in case uh, any requirement is there. So uh, at, the, uh, at the end, I feel uh, personally that the whole world is on the right track of controlling uh, environmental degradation. Because, you know, uh, the, me the measures which I mentioned are all known, understood, and being tackled by protocols. The only thing I wanted to say that resources permitting, uh, all of us should be able to move to a more sustainable habitat and a more sustainable population. And this, of course, uh, may require, you know, controlling populations, but that has to be seen by each and every individual government. Uh, India has done, uh, you know, uh, yesterday Prime Minister announced another um, uh, issue, said in abatement of pollution and uh, stopping environmental degradation will be his high priority and he will do it with the help of citizens. So in other words, it will be done on mission mode. That's a very welcome statement. Already in India, which I mentioned, you know, there are, uh, you know, in addition to banning old vehicles, India has implemented CNG, electric vehicles, and uh, introduction of ethanol, which is less polluting than, than petrol. So thank you very much. Uh, I think I've spoken a lot and a lot of issues were rather technical. I don't know whether people enjoyed them, full of figures also. And I'll be welcome to uh, answer any questions if there are any, any from any person in the audience. Thank you very much. Any questions? Prashant, any questions? Well, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Oh, see, sorry, I didn't know I, you could hear me. That's great because right. I hear you and thank you for your very, very good talk, uh, Panjak, and especially what you've achieved with 110,000, uh, sorry, 110 million toilets. That is an incredible achievement. You know, that you, that then, yeah. <laughs> that's an incredible achievement. So I, I think congratulations to you for, for, for initiating that, that. But also, I think, you know, you mentioned there all of what you're doing with forestry and the importance of planting trees. <clears throat> how critical this is for, in, for so many issues in terms of sequestering carbon emissions, but also in, in helping to attenuate flooding, et, et cetera. And I know there's an awful lot of really good things happening in India. And I'm also very grateful to the fact that you have alerted us to a lot of the problems we have here in Ireland, you know? I'm very yeah. conscious of the fact that, you know, we have so, so many cattle in Ireland, that our greenhouse gas emissions from cattle is incredibly high, you know? and you know, in, in terms of the future, you know, when we look at population increasing and by 2050, probably another 2 billion people on the planet, when climate change issues and biodiversity loss are increasing, how do you feel in terms of this larger population, or how we're going to be able to feed people when there's so many pressures on resources and where so many people now are, are eating meat that never had meat before on the planet. And meat is a very carbon intensive diet, you know? So where do we go with food production? Do we have to move towards a plant-based food production globally? Because it's a much more efficient way of using land. You know, what are your views on, on, on that whole issue of food, especially with the global heating occurring and all of these other impacts? Of course, uh, food is a personal choice, but uh, you, you've seen the recent trend, you know, uh, increasingly the world is uh, moving towards vegetarianism. So you find people in US, for example, and even in Europe, large number of people are adopting what India has always been uh, advocating, that vegetarianism. On the contrary, you find in India, people are becoming non-vegetarian. It's the opposite which is happening. So, But these are cycles, you know, which will come and go. And uh, personally, we belong to a family which is vegetarian. I mean, Jains, you know, Jain is a religion and uh, you might have heard. And we are supposed to be traditionally vegetarian. But many Jains have become non-vegetarian over time. 
Now, the other issue about increasing population, that is what I mentioned in my last uh, para when I was speaking, that uh, we have to move uh, towards a sustainable population. So if the world has to survive, then the planet can uh, you know, uh, hold only so much population and not more. Because it has to be integrated with the, uh, you know, the resources which are available. If you increase the population, then you will outstrip the, uh, I mean, you will exploit the resources more and more. And you will start degrading it more and more. It will not be sustainable. You have to bring back the same amount as you are consuming in order to uh, be sustainable. Now, what I look at it is that um, uh, the, with increasing new technologies, that is a possibility that you may be able to reduce the carbon footprint and also by having areas which are carbon neutral. For example, if you have nuclear power in India is going on that, you know, you, you are aware of the International Solar Alliance. India has uh, started that, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, initiated that and India was the first uh, chairperson of that in International Solar Alliance. The countries, I uh, won't say Ireland, but many countries have a huge amount of sunshine. And one, of course, is India. So cleaner technology, move towards cleaner technology like wind energy or sun or, or uh, nuclear. That is uh, something which can reduce the pollutions. But still, you will have problems on the water availability front. I mean, if you have 2 billion people more being added, I hope not. By 2050, it looks a little scary. Because India is trying to control population and both China and India are expanding their populations. But if that happens, then uh, certainly water is going to be a huge problem. It's already a problem in India. You don't have enough water to drink. Many people, uh, you know, per capita is very low. To move towards sustainable, that's my issue. And that is uh, Mr. Jan, uh, little technology difficulties. So uh, Duncan is moving in other location here, and no I'm working with uh, one more uh, expert. So uh, the other uh, expert will speak a uh, few minutes, and then we conclude and continue with, with this session. So Thank you. I'm just sending him invitation. numbered in, in the millions in terms of, of small scale plants um, and also going into the medium scale and the large scale. So within the medium scale plant, uh, which would cater for a herd size 100 to maybe 500 cows, where we're seeing a lot of the development here in Ireland, um, having access to technology that can solve that issue and, and, and can be adopted into those farms would be a great advantage. So we would see that as one area where collaboration would be of great benefit. So we'd be looking for technology there, such as uh, combined heat and power plants. We'd be looking for uh, small CHP units for to take biogas, convert it into electricity and heat. Um, eventually small upgrading units, because as we see over the next couple of years, the and as has already been mentioned, um, how we decarbonize our transport system is a, a big factor now. So for technologies such as, uh, you know, we, we see diesel and petrol being phased out. So electric is, is one good technology, but it's limited for, for heavy goods vehicles. It, it, it's very good for personal transport, but when we look at how we transport our goods, um, it doesn't have the, the, the we, first of all, we don't have the resources to produce all the batteries that would be required. We don't have the, the, the natural resources, to, in particular uh, elements like cobalt and, and um, uh, is, is lithium are in very short supply. So those areas, so we, we cannot produce enough batteries for all of that. We do know that biogas and biomethane is an excellent transport fuel. It, it readily fits into existing um, trucks with small small conversions. Um, you can buy um, off the shelf vehicles that will run on both biogas and on diesel and petrol. So you've got some um, resilience there for an, an easier crossover for, for the, the entire transport fleet. And it's an area where we are really looking at in terms of how we get the best value from that gas, how we utilize, um, like every resource that we have has to be utilized to its maximum potential. And 
transport has always proved a difficult one because uh, the, the technologies that are available to, to decarbonize our transport infrastructure are limited. So we do have ethanol, biodiesel is possibly at, the, at worldwide limits at this point in what we can produce sustainably. Um, possibly could go higher, but again, the, the sustainability factor really comes into play here. And the biomethane is an area where we see huge potential for growth in the next couple of years. After that, there are other areas such as um, in, in Ireland, but also reflective across the world. We have traditionally, or sorry, in the last number of decades, gotten used to heating our homes with, with large amounts of fossil fuels. Uh, kerosene would be a very popular fuel in Ireland. Um, and how we convert those, that housing stock into technologies that are low carbon. So one technology is obviously heat pumps. Uh, that requires a certain design of house, and we would already have figures to look at Ireland in terms of what houses are suitable. Um, you need to have uh, high levels of in, uh, relatively high levels of insulation for a heat pump to work. You need to have circulation temperatures under 60 degrees uh, for heat pumps to be at their most efficient. And so between they they will cater for that market, but we've a huge stock of houses in this country that can't be catered for by a heat pump without major retrofit. And not to get into too much detail on that, but the, these the major ref, retrofits that we're looking for, we don't have the workforce to us to um, achieve that in the next 10 to 15 years. And um, indeed, uh, 20 years would be um, very ambitious to achieve the level of of retrofit on houses that we need. So in the interim we are looking at the other technologies such as wood pellets, uh, wood pellet boilers, replacing kerosene directly into, in particular in rural um, houses where you would have the space, you would have the, the, the ability to, to make such a conversion. So one of the things we are looking at here is what sort of a modular unit could be produced. Um, and this is, you know, whether it could be in Ireland or in, in another country that, that can take uh, wood pellets, take out your oil boiler and, and readily convert it into a, a, into a pellet system um, or small wood chip system that doesn't require massive investment by the homeowner. And we do believe there are solutions there um, that, that, that would decarbonize very quickly our current stock. Um, the other technologies that come into play would be when we are retrofitting, we're looking at heat pumps. We also have to look at, uh, and very importantly, our air heat exchangers. Um, rather than putting vents into our rooms for fresh air, by putting in ventilation systems with heat recovery, uh, there is huge potential to save um, losses through, through space heating. So that's another factor that, that comes into play. And the technology for that, we don't have manufacturers in Ireland. Uh, we are seeking manufacturers. There, there is plenty of technology in it. Um, sorry, sharing screen here with Duncan. So as, as we're looking, we're, we're limited to one third. But the, um, as we look forward into uh, what technology or where does those that equipment will come from, there are a number of European manufacturers. There are Chinese, but predominantly a lot of the manufacturers coming from from Asia, and uh, we are always looking for manufacturers of those uh, technologies that we, we can adopt into our, our building stock. So there's a quite a lot of, of work to be to be looked at there in, in what we can um, and, and what collaboration can happen that we could trade. And um, that we could uh, potentially be a market for that, that sort of equipment, um, and we would hope that we could build um, links between Ireland and India, where such technologies could be provided, uh, and that, that's probably the predominant thing we're looking at uh, at the moment in terms of, of how we would uh, look at collaboration. That is, manufacturing, uh, the the ability to access manufacturing in India would be of great benefit. Now, there's a lot of technology and a lot of know-how that we should share as well, and I think the the opening the door and having the conversations um, and really opens up to the possibilities. Um, I've only been involved in this process for the last couple of weeks and I've already found it very beneficial to see what is available and there's a lot of ideas starting to, to come about. So I think it's something that we should grow and, and get more and more people involved uh, to expand it to, to its best potential. So um, there's one other sector I was going to discuss as well um, in terms of we looked at the biogas, uh, the, the building retrofit um, and, and, and the biomass was in some of the buildings, the biomass is two separate things. But there's also a lot of materials and laboratory equipment required for um, developing our fuels here, developing biomass fuels, wood chip. So we're looking at things like drying ovens, balances, uh, profiles, size, testers, that sort of thing that we, we need that equipment. 
Uh, we don't have manufacturers of that here in Ireland. And uh, then requirement for that sort of equipment for laboratory, basic laboratory equipment in Ireland, uh, there is a need for that here at the moment. So they're the sort of areas that we are opening up and, and, and trying to find suppliers at this point in time. Thank you, Noel. Uh, any questions? Uh, there's one question that I'm showing up here. It is from India. Vertical farming uses much less soil, water, and space can be used to produce organic farming and is sustainable. Are India or Ireland doing anything in this field? Then we have another question. Gillian okay. Tool, excellent environmental presentation. We can learn a lot from your experiences. Thank you very much. Gillian Tool is public representative of County Meath. Thank you, Gillian, for your comment. So, yes. Now on the vertical farming, my, sorry. There's another question. I'm just reading out all these questions first, and then uh, you please respond, all of our uh, panelists. Is there a program for compensation of damage caused by new project to build 12 meter wide roads in Himalayas of Uttarakhand to connect all four Hindu pilgrimages? I think this is a question for Mr. because he has all the experience in this sector. Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, you want me to answer it right now? Yes, please. And. Oh, okay. Uh, this uh, very uh, nice question has been put. You know, you can take the matter, the people who are actually affected by it, to the NGT mm -hmm. and ask them to uh, force the Uttarakhand government to make a redevelopment plan of the area. Mm -hmm. In other words, to mitigate each and every damage which you feel has been done can mm -hmm. be ordered by the NGT. That is one thing. Mm -hmm. Second, you know, while uh, the, when the project clearance is uh, done, Mm -hmm. they uh, would have uh, taken uh, money for the reforestation. So you can uh, pose a question to the Ministry of Environment that mm -hmm. uh, please tell us that what you have done when the trees were cut, the project must have given funds for compensatory reforestation. Mm -hmm. So have you done anything about it? What are the plans to mm -hmm. create the forest? These two, but they are uh, bound to create, uh, put in place mitigation measures for any damage which you feel has mm -hmm. been done and which has not been compensated properly, not in terms of cash, mm -hmm. but in terms of the kind, you know, repair and things like that. It's not just peripheral repair. The environment should be put back in the same condition. That is mm -hmm. the idea. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Jain. And uh, any comments or observation from Duncan Stewart or Noel? Yeah, uh, um, can I come in there on the question about vertical farming and on you know organic growing? Now, maybe if I just take the issue, I think, yes, I think there's huge opportunities, especially in urban areas or close to urban areas of, of vertical farming, because you can achieve much higher levels of production in these conditions. And, you know, it, it, it would be good if a lot of that energy that's required was solar rather than say LED, you know, and a lot can come, say, in India from from direct solar energy to 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 feed into this vertical farming. But if we take organic farming, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of benefits of organic farming in terms of health benefits, in terms of, you know, obviously, no pesticides being, you know, wildlife benefits from it. You know, th there are huge benefits of it, less damage to rivers, etc. But the unfortunate problem with organic farming is that it takes up more areas of land. But to overcome that problem, I think globally we need to shift away from cattle production, which uses up huge amounts of land in a very inefficient way to produce nutrients for people. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we grow plant-based food products, as Panjak was talking about earlier, we can, we can use the land much more effectively and efficiently and that allows us to grow organically in that situation. So I think the shift away from meat diet globally and the production of meat on farms, especially where they're so high in Ireland in the numbers of cattle, etc., 
we can solve a lot of our problem by reducing meat consumption down to probably a quarter of what it is now. In other words, not banning meat, but just reducing the amount of meat we, we, we consume and shifting that land over to organic growing and to more biodiverse uh, areas, in other words, for, for biodiversity to, to enhancement, etc. And obviously for river quality enhancement, because it's the problem is that over the last century in my talk, I meant to talk about the fact that we, 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 we quadrupled as a population in 100 years. You know, now it's 7.8 billion people. But in that 100 years, our farm animals, we, we basically multiplied our farm animals eightfold in that time, which meant massive encroachment into wildlife areas and into nature. And this is a fundamental problem with population. We were talking about population earlier on and population increase. If we were to shift away from meat production using cattle and ranches, etc. Duncan, 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 we got to your point, and uh, today we are in limited in our time because other sessions okay. are just lined sure. up. But thank you so much, Mr. Jan, Duncan, and Noel. You contributed hugely, and I believe this is not the session that we could conclude here. The further discussions and deliberations required on environment, and we are happy to facilitate further communication between. Uh, all of you experts.